Well, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to be finishing up our time in Hebrews this morning as we have taken a, a short break into the um, This morning is going to be our last time in Hebrews. And really the, the plan, I want to make you guys aware for the next few weeks, preaching-wise, is I'm obviously preaching this morning, and then I will preach the next two Sundays. And then after that is our Easter Sunday, and Smed will resume preaching on Easter Sunday. And then the week after that, Lord willing, uh, he will uh, take us back into Romans, and we'll jump back into Romans and continue our, our time in the book of Romans together. And that is, that is our plan, but we know and have seen very closely the last several weeks that man plans his ways and the Lord directs his paths, and uh, that is true for this as well. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 32 through 39. And if you're wondering if Julie is going to illustrate my message as Sarah did for Eric, the answer is no, not this morning. She won't be doing that. And I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been handed two pieces of a puzzle? Handed two pieces of a puzzle and told that they go together only to find it quite difficult to get them to come together. They don't fit like they should. Maybe you even quickly responded, these aren't the right pieces. They don't fit together. And then with the simple rotation of one piece, you find that they indeed are the perfect fit. You are simply holding them wrong. Well, God's sovereignty in saving and in keeping his saints and man's responsibility to persevere in the faith can oftentimes seem at odds with one another. And this isn't a reflection of these truths, but the fact that it, if it seems that way, the fact is that we're actually holding them wrong because they actually fit together perfectly. God, in his divine, incomparable wisdom, has both ordained the means of salvation which is through his son's work in the gospel and God in his infinite wisdom has ordained the means of remaining in the faith, which is a persevering faith, a faith that continues, a faith that endures to the end, that perseveres to the end. God is God over both of these things. An authentic, genuine, saving faith is a faith that presses forward and continues on for as long as the Lord gives that one to live. A real, genuine faith from the Lord will endure, whether it's five seconds before passing into the Lord's presence or 80 years of faithfulness before him. A genuine faith is a persevering faith, and if one does not persevere, it is a revealer that they never possessed real faith. The author of Hebrews has been setting this reality forth with masterful precision. Remember two weeks ago when in verses 19 through 21, he summarized the amazing work that Jesus did, the amazing work of Jesus, that Jesus is not only the superior priest on behalf of those who are saved, but he is the priestly sacrifice which has been offered once and for all that grants us access to the very real presence of God. It was himself, it was by his blood offered up. And the only sacrifice that could grant to us this salvation is the perfect holy sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing we could do. There's no works we could add to what Jesus has accomplished. There's nothing we can do to more save ourselves. It is all by Christ, only by Christ. It is Jesus alone, his perfect obedience and sacrifice has made a way for the forgiveness of sins. And that is wonderful news. That is the good news of the gospel. And then the author of Hebrews followed this up with commands for what an embracing of Jesus as your high priest should produce. And it was threefold. There were three commands. Draw near to God. It produces a drawing near to God when you embrace Jesus as your high priest. Hold fast your confession. And it includes an intentional consideration of others for the purpose of spurring on to love and to good deeds. 
We could summar it up th- sum- summarize it this way. It's a love for God and a love for others. Then in verse 26 through 31, we saw the warning to not continue on sinning, to not continue in willful defiance against God. As those who are truly his, we are to respond in love. We're to respond in obedience, not responding in defiance, willful continuing of sin. In fact, for those who associate with the people of God and know specifically the truth of Jesus, but walk in continual, intentional, willful defiance, we see there is actually a more strict punishment for that one. And those who have true faith in Jesus don't, in practice, reject the one they declare to follow. And if you are in unwilling, intentional defiance against God, you should be concerned regarding the genuineness of your faith, for it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There should be a sober reminder for each of us to embrace God's means for keeping his children, which is through a persevering faith. And we know this persevering faith isn't necessarily a faith that produces sinless perfection, but one that produces submission and holiness of life, a humbling of oneself under the Lord. Our salvation is through the work of Christ by the power of God alone, and our security is founded upon what Christ has done and is in Christ's power alone. And if you are Christ, nothing can separate you from the love of God. You can't unsave yourself. And fitting perfectly with that, if you are in Christ, you will persevere to the end. God is the one who keeps us. This is demonstrated through the Christian persevering in and pressing on in faith. And your confidence of Christ's power at work in you is your endurance in in faith. And of course, God knows all of this. You aren't proving anything to God by walking in obedience. You are rather demonstrating outwardly what is true inwardly When there is fruit and obedience and endurance, there is for that one a confidence in Christ, that Christ is indeed at work in you. This is the same reality that we saw when we went through the book of James. We saw genuine faith produces works or obedience. It's not that works produce genuine faith or works produce salvation. Salvation, God's changing of your life, granting to you faith, produces works. And an imposter faith has no works. A false faith, an imposter faith. The works, your deeds are not the saving agent, but the revealer of what has taken place inwardly. And what we see is that a saving faith is an enduring faith. It's a persevering faith. It's a, it's a faith that presses on. It doesn't shrink back. So let's read together our passage for this morning, Hebrews 10, 32 through 39. Read with me, starting in verse 32. But remember the former days. When after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partially by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction but of those who have faith to the 
preserving of the soul. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. We ask this morning as we look at what you have revealed and your desire for your children, your desire for those whom you love, is that we would press forward, that we wouldn't shrink back. Thank you that the the hope that we have isn't found in ourselves, but it is found in you. And I pray that this morning we would have soft, humble hearts before you to hear what we must about you, that we would be moldable, that we would find comfort where we need it and encouragement and strength, that we would persevere, have endurance. Lord, that we would respond to conviction appropriately in repentance where we need to as well. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Press on in persevering faith. Press on in persevering faith. If you are in Christ, there is no obstacle more powerful, more influencing. There is nothing that can keep you from living in accordance to that faith. You have everything you need from Christ. So the call is for us to walk in it, to persevere in faith, to press forward in faith, to press on, continue in persevering faith. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember that from verse 31. So don't, don't apostate, don't demonstrate your faith to be an imposter, false faith by shrinking back to destruction. Don't be the seed that sprouts up quickly on rocky soil only to be scorched by the trials and persecutions of this world. Rather, persevere, endure, let your faith be put on display as you walk faithfully and all the more when it is difficult. Because a tested faith demonstrates it is an enduring faith. It is a persevering faith. It is a faith that progresses holding on to the the critical elements of the Christian faith and eagerly embraces the practices of the Christian faith. The author earnestly desires those to whom he is writing to, to press on, to persevere in faith, to not shrink back. And he gives two aids to this. Don't fall into the hands of the living God, but... And then we see the command, remember. And he gives instruction to aid believers in pressing on in faith that only God can give. So press on in persevering faith. Number one, the aid to helping us do that is this. Press on in persevering faith, remembering your past faithfulness. Press on in persevering faith, remembering your past faithfulness. Verse 32, look down, he says, remember, but remember. This is to recall, it's to be reminded, to think about, to consider the former days. Remember what happened in the past and what we'll see is particularly what you endured for Christ. Remember the former days. Remember your past faithfulness. Remember before when you counted the cost of following Jesus and you concluded he's worth it. He says, remember the former days when you, after being enlightened, and we have to spend a little bit of time on that word enlightened. Enlightened here means we're exposed to. That is being exposed to the truth. The author of Hebrews uses that word this way to describe those who were around the people of God, benefited from being around the people of God, were enlightened in that they tasted the good word of God. Not as in regeneration, but enlightened. You were exposed to the truth of God. You were presented with the truth of the gospel. That's what's meant by the word enlightened. And what makes the difference is not that you heard the truth only, but that you endured for it. You embraced it. You sacrificed. You counted the cost. And you pressed on. That puts on display what you did with that truth you were exposed to. And so the emphasis isn't on simply if someone was enlightened, but how they lived after hearing the truth. It's the response you had, the response. Unbelievers can be enlightened. They can even conform their actions. They can hang around the church. And what makes the difference is, did you endure? 
Has the truth you have heard taken root in your heart in such a way that how you live is changed and you press on in faithfulness? Again, God knows the reality of our heart, yet how we live puts on display for us what God has done. The author has already made this principle clear in Hebrews 6, 12, that to be enlightened is not to be saved. Earlier in chapter 6 of Hebrews, he speaks to those who partook in heavenly blessings. They were enlightened, but they fell away. And then in verse 12, he says, we are convinced of better things for you, things that accompany salvation. That's what the author here is pointing to. You were enlightened and then you endured hardship. And what should aid you in pressing on in faith is not merely what you know about God, but how you responded to what you know about God. Remember, remember. And this is so crucial that we press on in obedience, that we press on in faith, that we press on in submission and yielding ourselves to the Lord. Some would say simply remember truths about the gospel and everything will fall into place. Don't give careful consideration to how you live for Christ. Just remember, 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 and let whatever happens, happen. Don't take drastic, specific measures to walk in obedience. They would even go so far as to, to slap, slap the label of legalism on someone who takes holiness serious, which is heartbreaking. They would say, don't take specific measures to walk in obedience, to put deed, deeds of the flesh to death. Then on the other end, others might say, make sure you're good enough for God. Muster up in your own strength to make sure that you're doing enough good so that God would then accept you. And scripture doesn't endorse either of those methods. You have to remember truth. Yes, in Hebrews 10, chapter 10, we saw this. The summary of the 10 chapters of Hebrews, teaching, explaining, detailing the all-sufficient work of Jesus in the gospel to transform, to redeem, to justify, to forgive the sinner and, and fitting together perfectly the call to endure to persevere, to hold fast, to press on, to obey, to pursue holiness in response to what God has done. Both are to be present. What should bolster our assurance in the Lord is not what wonderful truths we can articulate about God or our emotional excitement about them, but rather our faithfulness to him. Are we living consistently with what we proclaim? That is the clearest expression of genuine faith. A lot of people can speak boldly about God when there is no cost. It is a much better thing to live faithfully for God when there is conflict, when it is hard, when it is costly. Verses 33 and 34, the author describes the specific way those to whom he is writing endured great conflict. And he breaks it down into to two categories. First, look at verse 33. Partially by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. And then secondly, and partially by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. First, partially by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. He says, you experienced reproaches. This is public shame. You were mocked. You were a public spectacle. You were exposed to public ridicule. You were put to shame, humiliation, disgrace, and tribulations. That is affliction, abuse, oppressions, physical affliction, violence, and you were sharers with those who were so treated. And then he clearly has specific things in mind in verse 34. How did they share with those who were mistreated? What were the afflictions? What were the, the public spectacle that was made of them? The reproaches, the tribulation? Verse 34, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. 
You showed sympathy. You came alongside. You had compassion towards those Christians who were already prisoners. They did this and accepted joyfully the seizure of their property. To associate with prisoners was a a shameful thing. And it seems that they were watching who would tend to these prisoners, who would associate with them, and then they would capitalize on the opportunities that they had to seize their property for doing so. And the author is saying to these early Christians, remember, remember when you had to count the cost of following Jesus and you loved other believers in this way at great cost to yourselves. You had your property seized, your possessions plundered, and you accepted it joyfully. Remember just a few verses before the call, consider, let us consider how we can stimulate. I can only imagine that that was what was on the mind of these early believers as they cared for those prisoners at great cost to themselves. They considered what would be a blessing to others and they were willing to press on in that faithfully, in love, in sacrifice, and they did it joyfully. They did it joyfully. Because they knew. They did this knowing they had a better possession than all of their things that moth eats and rust destroys. They had a lasting possession. They had a superior possession that is a lasting and eternal one. You had a possession in Christ, in your salvation that no one could seize, no one could touch, no one could plunder, no one could snatch away. It endures forever. And so you counted the cost and you were faithful. Remember that. In your present trials, in your present living, remember God's grace evident in your life. Remember God's grace in your extraordinary circumstances. And today, keep pressing on, endure, and remember these things. Are you struggling today? Are you struggling to press on in faith today? What are your hallmark faith moments? What do you need to be reminded of? What are the moments early in your Christian walk where you can look and say, I embraced the truth of the gospel. I lived faithfully for Christ's sake. What are the moments of past faithfulness in your life? Are there things you gave up in the past joyfully for the sake of serving Christ? As you seek to press on in faith, what has it looked like in the past where you pressed on in faith in the midst of trial, in the midst of ridicule, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of losing a promotion, in the midst of strained relationships, in the midst of losing your possessions? Maybe when you came to Christ, you were going down a path in your profession and said, I can't do this anymore. It violates my conscience. And you lost your job or you missed out on a promotion. Maybe you had sin in your life that you loved and your life revolved around serving this idol and this sin. And you said, no more. Christ is better. Maybe your family rejected you And in the face of an ultimatum and having to choose between people whom you love and you knew would reject you, you counted the cost and said, Christ is better. I choose faithfulness to Jesus, knowing that what you had in him was superior and lasting. Maybe you're a new believer now. Maybe your endurance today in faith is something that one day down the road you'll need to remember. Maybe what you're experiencing right now is what you're going to look back and remember when suffering for Jesus is hard. 
to look back and see God's grace in your life, to be reminded of God's goodness, to be reminded of God's strength, to, to be reminded of the joy that's only found in Christ in those times when you were struggling and you were faltering and you pressed on faithfully and experienced all the joy and all the comfort and all the hope and all the peace that comes from submitting your life to Christ, having fellowship with him and forsaking the world as it is always far better. We need that reminder. My prayer is that this season of uncertainty and trial for so many of us is something we'll look back and remember as a church and say, remember COVID-19? Remember when we weren't sure what the next hour would bring? Remember when we were social distancing? Remember when we live streamed our service? Remember when Eric told our kids to shout answers in our homes so loud he could hear them at the church? Remember when the most precious commodity in our society was toilet paper? Remember when those among us got sick? Remember when those among us lost jobs, lost savings, closed businesses? Do you remember those things? And do you remember how we joyfully trusted God? And while the world was anxious and angry and frustrated and arguing and grasping for self and complaining about one another, remember when we loved? Remember when we were content? Remember when we were patient? Remember when we were generous? That's my prayer for us. Press on and persevering faith, remembering your past faithfulness. And next, number two, this morning, press on in persevering faith, holding fast your present confidence. Holding fast your present confidence. Hold fast your present confidence. Now, the author actually says this in the negative. He says, do not throw away your confidence. And this instruction flows from the first one. We'll look at verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Therefore helps us see that this instruction flows from the first one. It's a conjunction. Therefore, it helps us see that. And so just follow this flow of thought. Remember where we've been. Here's the superior priestly work of Jesus. So live rightly in light of this. And listen, there is a warning. Should you not... Don't, after knowing these things and hearing of these things, don't willfully sin and in practice reject these things. Rather, press on in enduring faith. Press on in enduring faith. Don't grow lazy, but rather, rather remember. Remember God's grace in your life in the past and let that be a means of grace to help you endure in the present. Remember how you, you held to and knew the eternal treasure of Christ and how that drove you to obedience and love in the midst of hardship and trial. Remember that. And therefore, therefore, don't throw away your confidence. Remembering what God has done in the past and his faithfulness to us as we endure hardship and we look to his grace and we walk in his strength. Remembering that grants to us a confidence and don't forsake that. Don't abandon that. Don't throw away your confidence. Remember how you held to and knew the eternal of treasure of Christ. Hold fast to your present confidence, which has a great reward. Therefore, in light of your past faithfulness, and the confidence you possess because of it, don't throw it away now. Hold fast. Stay the course. What Christ has done in you in the past is a benefit for you today as it puts on display the reality of your salvation. And if you abandon that, you will demonstrate 
yourself to be apostate. So, so don't throw away your confidence, your boldness, your assurance by abandoning faithfulness to God. Press forward in obedience. Press forward in fidelity to God, in faithfulness to God. Don't shrink back, as he says in verse 39, and lose that precious confidence, which has a great reward for you. See, your confidence has a great reward in that it aids your endurance and your endurance is God's will for the believer so that they can receive what is promised. Let me say that again. Your confidence has a great reward in that it aids your endurance and your endurance is God's will for the believer so that they can receive what was promised. Why is this confidence such a great reward? Well, because you have need of endurance. And that confidence that God is at work in you helps you press forward so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Look again at verses 35 and 36. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what has promised. Have you ever felt like obedience to Christ was a hardship? It was a burden? It should be a joy that we embrace as it grants a reward better than any physical possession, for it grants to you a confidence in the Lord that aids you in endurance so that you press on and receive what is promised for God's people. Maybe an analogy to help us with this. If someone claims to be a hiker, I hike. They may set out on a trail and they hike that trail. Every trail hiked instills confidence that they can complete then the next hike that comes. That's the idea here. And a real hiker will keep on. And each completed hike gives them a confidence to endure the next one. A non-hiker may make it through a couple trails. But eventually they'll shrink back. Demonstrate that that was never actually their identity. Because at the core, they're not a hiker. Well, then the author of Hebrews gives us this quote from Habakkuk, and it's just perfect in light of what he is writing here. We see that in the next couple verses. Uh, By way of reminder, Habakkuk was written just as God is using Babylon to bring judgment upon Judah for their rebellion against him and their disobedience. And the book of Habakkuk is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God as Habakkuk is struggling to come to grips with the reality that God is using this pagan nation of Babylon to bring his judgment upon his people. Go ahead and turn to the book of Habakkuk. It's one of your minor prophets there, one of the smaller books in the Bible. After Nahum before Zephaniah. Habakkuk chapter 2. We're going to primarily look at verses 3 and 4. Habakkuk chapter 2. The author quotes from chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. You can see it there. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, it will not delay. And then verse four, behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Now in Hebrews, he says, he who is coming will come. In Habakkuk, he says the vision, verse three, do you see that there at the beginning? For the vision is yet In Habakkuk, it says the vision, verse 3, and then the end of verse 3, it is referring to the vision with the word it, and it says it will certainly come, the vision will certainly come. If you were to read through chapter 2 of Habakkuk, you would see that the fulfillment of the vision is that God is going to come and judge, and not only Babylon, but his people, and in verse 12, he says he's going to fill the earth with his glory, and verse 20, all the earth should be silent before him, verse 12 of Habakkuk and verse 20 of Habakkuk. 
So in Habakkuk in verse 3, it is the vision, which is referring to the Messiah who will come. And then in Hebrews, we know the Messiah who was to come is Jesus. And yet again, he's going to return and he, in a little while, will come and will not delay and will judge And in Habakkuk, when he says in verse 4, the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous live by faith. We know for Habakkuk, he had to trust in the promise of the Messiah, even though he had not seen him, even though he was in the midst of tremendous trial of captivity, he had to have faith, faith in the righteousness of God, in the coming judgment from God, that though circumstances are confusing and difficult and trying, God is doing it all and he will make things right. So it is for the New Testament believer, the righteous live by faith, the righteous endure. Jesus is coming and he will judge. Don't shrink back. Don't neglect the promise of God. Press on in enduring faith. Now turn back to Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll look at what the author of Hebrews says, verse 37 and 38. For yet, let's read it again. For yet, verse 37, in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. What he's saying is press on in persevering faith because Jesus the Messiah is coming. He's going to return. He's coming soon. And those who are God's, the righteous ones, they live by faith, an enduring faith, a, a preserved faith, a persevering faith. And in contrast to those who shrink back, It's a contrast to those who do not persevere, who who do not endure, who do not demonstrate themselves to have ever actually been his at all. And his soul, God's soul, has no pleasure in him. And then verse 39, the same terminology as in verse 28, taken from Habakkuk, those who shrink back, or 38, sorry, same as in 38, taken from Habakkuk, those who shrink back and those who have faith. Verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, the ones that God has no pleasure in. We are not of those, the author says. We are not of those, but rather of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. That's how God keeps us. That's how God preserves us. That's how we persevere. God's grace, God's strength, God's power, God's doing in causing us to endure to the end, to press on. There are those who hear the truth of the gospel They engage with the people of God. They may even have some positive signs of counting the cost of following Jesus. But eventually there is a breaking point. Enough circumstances pass. The pressure becomes too much. The cost too high. There is an idol of which they are unwilling to yield to the Lord. They are unwilling to let go of. And they shrink away. They demonstrate that their original faith was an imposter faith as genuine faith always endures to the end. Whenever that is, end is. There is a a shrinking back to destruction, but then there is, as we see in the second half, there are those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Where are you in this this morning? Have you shrunk back? Maybe there was a time where you you heard the good news about God. You responded in the moment. were excited about it. But there is an area of your life where you are unwilling to yield. You have been unwilling to yield. And you continue on in defiance. 
in a willing disobedience? I would urge you, repent. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Christ. If you are teetering, remember what, what God has done in your life in the past. Remember the treasure that he offers that is imperishable. Embrace Christ. Grace Bible Church, what is our current circumstances revealing about your faith? I believe there is much, much that we should be encouraged by. There is much fruit. There is love for each other that I have experienced from you this week, that I have seen among you this week, that I have heard of. Ways that you are creatively going after serving of one another, heart care, encouragement, and I would say just excel still more. Keep on pressing on for the treasure of Christ far outweighs anything that we might lose in this world. So press on in faith for Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. We thank you for your divine power that grants to us everything that we need for life and godliness so that we can endure, so that we can press on, so that we can, by your grace, be faithful. I pray that that would be the case for us as a church, that we would be humble before you, that we would love each other well that we would draw near to you, that we would hold fast the confession of our hope, that we would count the cost and every single time we would know and we would believe and we would press on convinced that Christ is better. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.